Um, we have Dr. Uh, Ravi Nayak from St. Louis University School of Medicine, SLU. Um, and he'll be talking a little bit on cardiac sarcoidosis as well as just touching on some of the pulmonary aspects of it as well. Hi, I'm Ravi Nayak. I'm from St. Louis University. Are you guys having a good time so far? Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> good. good. So, I'll be talking about pulmonary and cardiac sarcoidosis. What I plan to do is also talk about general uh, aspects of sarcoidosis, otherwise we'll be lost in following the disease, okay? I do not have any conflict, okay, with this talk. Okay, so the, the epidemiology, it can affect all races and ethnic groups and occurs at all ages, okay? It usually occurs before the age of 50. The peak incidence is between 20 to 40 years, okay? Ethnicity-wise, it's common among Northern Europeans, Japanese, and in the U.S., it's more common among African Americans, okay? And African Americans also get the severe form of disease, and it can also occur later, uh, later in life and disease can be chronic and fatal in African Americans, okay? And in Scandinavian women, we see two peaks. One is the earlier peak, between 25 to uh, 29 years, and one is after the age 60, okay? So you have heard enough about granuloma. I'm not gonna bore you with the granuloma again. So granuloma is the cornerstone of uh, sarcoidosis. That's all we need to remember for now, okay? And I have pictures to show you different for, uh, parts of the body being involved. Here in the nasal, in the, in the nose, okay? And it's, this is in the joint, okay? Scar on the skin, I have one more slide to show you. Any scar on the skin, if you biopsy, or if a scar changes, that can show granuloma, okay? Here in the lungs, it's a collection of cells, the granuloma, okay? And then uh, this is in the lacrimal gland in the eyes. And this is a uh, post-mortem or after autopsy findings showing the granulometrous lung disease, okay? So what are the uh, clinical symptoms, okay? One of the things I always teach my trainees is, please remember fatigue as one of the symptoms of sarcoidosis. Many of you can agree with me on that one, okay? And you have to be very aggressive in treating fatigue, weight loss, low-grade fever, and of course, we'll have abnormal chest X-ray. We have to remember most of the cases like may resolve by themselves, you know, despite of doctors, okay? So you may not need anything. So and about one, two-thirds of the patients may have disease for 10 years or longer, and one-third have really unrelenting progressive disease. Death is in about 5%. It is usually caused by pulmonary sarcoid. Cardiac sarcoid, I have a slide on that one later on. It's an important cause of mortality and neurosarcoidosis you have already spoken about, okay? So this is uh, uh, also on the website of a foundation. The 30 to 50% of the cases have respiratory symptoms as shortness of breath, cough, and chest pain. And 90% of the patients have uh, lung sarcoidosis. That's how I get involved. You know, many times lung symptom is nothing, but I get uh, referred by ophthalmologists to treat the patients for sarcoidosis. Okay, cardiac sarcoidosis is much more common than previously report. Okay, it can cause loss of pumping function of the heart. Okay, and it can also cause irregular heartbeats. Okay, and. Uh, Cardiac and neurosarcoidosis can happen without any involvement of sarcoidosis anywhere else in the body. Okay, you have to remember that one. And we do have chest X-ray stages, which I will show you in a little bit. But I have patients with stage one sarcoidosis with severe brain involvement, severe heart involvement. Stage three chest X-ray does not reflect severe involvement in the other organs. So you have to remember that, okay? This is a fairly new entity. We have been talking about this a lot. The pulmonary hypertension due to sarcoidosis. We do not know what exactly do with this. Uh, some places in, in Cincinnati have enrolled patients for uh, treatment of pulmonary hypertension, okay? But please remember, pulmonary hypertension is the 
hypertension of the right side of the heart if you want to remember that way so if you have pressure on the left side of the heart we check the blood pressure by tying the cuff on your arm right but the right side pressures can be checked only by two methods one is by doing an echocardiogram of the heart ultrasound of the heart or putting catheter straight into the heart okay so different places have been discovering it more you know you can see that the place that does the transplant sees the most pulmonary sarcoidosis that's in since uh, Cincinnati also has one. So I, as I told you, there are two methods to check the pulmonary hypertension. The open bar is echocardiogram. Echocardiogram is the ultrasound of the heart. And the solid black bar is uh, by cardiac catheterization, okay? This is a famous staging of uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis. When you have that lymph node on either side of the heart is enlarged, that's stage one, okay? So the, what is more important with the pulmonary staging is when you have only this involvement and no other organ involvement, you should not undergo any treatment. Your chances of, you know, um, being cured of this disease by itself is about 55 to 90 percent. But you have lymph node enlargement and also some shadows in the lungs, we call it opacities. You still will be cured without anything. It will resolve by itself in about 40 to 70 percent of the day. But when it comes to here, chances are only 10 to 20 percent. Here, it, the disease tend to become chronic and relent, you know, and becomes relentless. And this is like a fibrosis, okay? Like, like a stage four sarcoidosis is like fibrosis. Any question on this staging? That means it doesn't resolve. That it should say that there is no. This, once you have stage three, the resolution is about ten to twenty percent. Once you have stage four, it is you need intervention. So I have some cool pictures of the high resolution CT scan of the chest. Please remember, uh, if you see doctors for <coughs> sarcoidosis, high resolution CT scan of the chest is a good modality. For diagnosis, okay. In last ten years, we are we are we are very good about diagnosing sarcoidosis through CT scan. We pretty much know now that we can say with certainty this looks like sarcoid. Okay. So remember, sarcoidosis is like an upper lobe predominant lung disease. It's not in the lower part of the lungs predominant. It's in the upper part of the lungs. Okay. And you can have the lymph node enlargement. We talked about the lymph node enlargement with the arrows here, okay? So, and we, we learn the characteristic patterns of the sarcoidosis. All the things happen in sarcoidosis um, is along the blood vessels in the lungs. That's how the chest radiologists now tell, you know, these are the, this can be present in only one or two cases, uh, one or two scenarios. We have very few differential diagnosis. One of the things you may want to write down is chronic beryliosis. Beryllium is a, a, a chemical that's present, uh, you can get exposed to when you work in for aeroplane industries or some industries. That's a one important differential diagnosis called beryliosis. Be boy, okay? That can also present like this. But if you do not have any other cause, then we do all the tests, we diagnose sarcoidosis, okay? And again, more lymph nodes here, okay? This is what you are talking about earlier. If you have this kind of fibrosis, you need intervention, okay? The, the black area is good, the white area is a fibrosis, okay? Sometimes it can be very subtle, so you need to really look for the cause in those cases, okay? Heart manifestations. You can have a lung sarcoid, you can have a neurosarcoid, and you can totally be asymptomatic, okay? We wouldn't know that. Conduction defects means, you know, the heart has to conduct the elect electrical uh, signals. So bundle branch block, atrial arrhythmias, upper chamber of the heart can have irregular heartbeat. We can have valvular defects, okay? Ventricle is the lower chamber of the heart. You can have irregular heartbeat of that one. Heart failure can happen and the fluid can get collected around the chest called pericardial effusion, okay? Cardiac sarcoidosis can be present in about 5% of the patients, but if you 
really look for it, it may be as high as 25%, but we will never know that, okay? But it's responsible for the 40% of the deaths due to sarcoidosis. So it's an important thing we need to look at. So after high resolution CT scan of the chest, I would like to draw your attention to the uh, two tests. PET scan, positron emission tomography and MRI, okay? MRI of the heart. <coughs> if it's like almost like a religion, people who do PET, they say PET is the best. People who do MRI, they all say MRI is the best, okay? So, but I, I would like to advise all of you, you should see how the place is to do uh, this kind of test. You know, Washu is very good, you know, I'm from Sulu, but I should say that Malincrod is very good in doing cardiac MRI and uh, PET scan. In Sulu, we have good chest radiologists, we do the MRI and we also have a protocol we developed for cardiac uh, mm -hmm. PET scan recently. But if you get it in other hospitals, you know, we don't know whether it's good or bad because you also have to have a good radiologist to read these things, okay? So, um, the the advantage of uh, MRI is the radiation uh, chances are less with MRI, okay? The ionizing radiation. But they are about the same. I just want to let you know. But PET scan, the beauty of PET scan is it can light up in some parts of the body which is easily accessible for biopsy, okay? So this is the PET scan and this is lit up in the lungs, okay? And we, it's always done with a CT scan. It's a corresponding cuts here, okay? Look at the PET scan, how it has lit up all over the body, okay? Okay, it's in the lungs, it's in the belly, liver, all the places, okay? And this is the PET scan. At the time of diagnosis, you have it in the lungs, then the heart, then three months later treatment, it is cured, okay? Or dissolved. This is an MRI of the heart. What we look in MRI is the enhancement, the delayed enhancement in the heart, okay? And again, famous granuloma here. After three months, that enhancement has decreased. If you have MRI at the baseline, you should follow up with the MRI down the road for follow up. If you had a PET scan at the baseline, follow up with a PET scan later on. MRI cannot be done in some centers if you have a pacemaker, but some centers they have a very specialized protocols to do cardiac MRI despite of pacemakers. Okay, not all hospitals can do that. Okay. You say uptake, does that just mean changes? Correct. Uptake means any cells that are active, okay, like cancer cells or inflammatory, if there's inflammation going on or infection going on, they pick up glucose. The PET scan uses glucose label material. So those cells take those material, and one of my patients talked to this word, they light up like Christmas tree. Yeah, that's okay. me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So this, you know, just want to let you know, you may have a cardiac sarcoid, you may have a neurosarcoid, but if a person has a, a change in tattoo, just biopsy the tattoo, you know, we have diagnosed about three or four cases by biopsying only tattoos. So tattoo changed here and tattoo got better down the road with the treatment, okay? But it saves a complex biopsy of uh, a difficult organ sometimes, okay? This just to, show you the different pictures, skin. You know, when you come for a lung sarcoidosis, it's my job to look for other features like skin, joint, heart, and uh, brain, okay? And this is simple skin. This is the lupus perineum. This is the skin changes around the nose. This is the, one of the hardest thing to treat in sarcoid, okay? This is in the eyes here, okay? This is the lacrimal duct. You can get facial palsies here. When we do a bronchoscopy, we get what is called a cobblestone appearance in the bronchoscopy. And what we do, we not only biopsy further down the lungs, we also biopsy the, the bronchial mucosa itself. It's easy to biopsy, less complications when we have this. Okay. This is a spinal cord with an MRI here. Okay. And this is again a PET scan showing all over the body. You can pick an easy organ to biopsy in that case. Okay. And one of the things I didn't show you earlier, that's why I added the picture here, you can, sarcoid can form a cavity. And if you have a cavity, a cavity means like a hole in the lungs, okay? In the cavity, fungus 
goes and resides. Okay, so it's like I tell my residents, it's like Bin Laden hiding in the cave. Okay, so okay, so it can happen. So biological markers. One of the things you always hear, doctors ordering angiotensin converting enzyme level. ACE level is angiotensin converting enzyme level. It can be elevated, but we should remember there is a whole list of diseases. It can be falsely elevated. One of the things you need to remember, if you are on a common medications like lisinopril, inalapril, they are so-called ACE inhibitors, ACE level will be low and it's of no use checking in those patients, okay? So how do we evaluate when we present to uh, people who do sarcoidosis, uh, doctors who specialize in that? Detailed history is important, physical exam. We have to take a detailed environmental history. Please remember when we diagnose sarcoidosis, we rule out all other things. Sarcoidosis by definition, we have to rule out all the other causes, okay? And we go for a biopsy of affected organs and we always get a special stains to look for bugs, okay? and chest radiograph, pulmonary function test, which I will be talking in a little bit. EKG has to be done in every patient, okay, to see whether they have any asymptomatic changes, like we call one of the common things we see is the right bundle branch block, okay. Complete eye exam is absolutely needed, but when we diagnose, we get detailed, com CBC is complete blood count. We always pay attention to calcium level. Uh, creatinine is for the uh, kidney function, LFP means liver function test, okay? And all, every patient I see with sarcoid, I get at least one 24 hour urine calcium at the time of diagnosis, okay? Other tests depend on the involved organs, lungs, the right heart catheterization, I told you, it's in a highly specialized center if you have pulmonary hypertension. Central nervous system, you can do MRI, okay? So how do we diagnose this? Just radiographic evidence, compatible clinical features. You have to show, demonstrate non-caseating granuloma, okay? And, but there's one disease I, I delete, took off the slide with the interest of time called Lockgren syndrome. It's like an acute sarcoidosis. It, it does not need biopsy. It needs a good clinician to diagnose. It presents with joint pains, some skin changes and radiological changes. We treat them with a leave-like medication, it goes away within a few weeks. You don't need to biopsy those cases, okay? The ACE level, angiotensin converting enzyme level, I would like to highlight. It's useful when it's elevated, but it can be elevated in other conditions too. And it can be falsely low in patients taking some of the medications I mentioned earlier, okay? And PET scan and MRI, it depends on the physician and the institutional experience when they want to evaluate the heart, okay? And if they have a, already have a pacemaker, PET scan may be a better choice there, okay? Pulmonary function test, this is my near and dear to my heart here. We, we look for restriction on a lung function test. Your total lung capacity is decreased. DLCO is your diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. Your ability to transfer gas in the lungs goes down. People think sarcoidosis is usually restriction, but it can also cause obstruction. Like in people who have smoked, you get obstructive lung disease, you can get similar PFTs also. Sarcoidosis is one of the few causes causing restriction and obstruction on pulmonary function tests. We have to remember that one, okay? Bronchoscopy is an excellent test. It's easy to do. This is a, uh, when we have lung sarcoidosis, the yield is about 85%. I would like to draw your attention to new tools we have. It's called endobronchial ultrasound. EUS is when the <coughs> stomach doctors, GI doctors do it. Endobronchial ultrasound, EBUS means we do it, okay? And this has helped us tremendously in diagnosing uh, sarcoidosis, okay? So the patients get referred to uh, us. What we do is, do we have clinical features suggestive of sarcoidosis? Yes. And we have one biopsy from a non-pulmonary source. We are done. I, just because they see me in lung clinic, I should not do the rip biopsy of lungs. If I have a skin biopsy, dermatology sends me a patient. And if there are other clinical features, I diagnose sarcoidosis and treat the lung sarcoidosis at the time too. 
If there are no clinical patients, look for other things, okay? The biopsy from a non-pulmonary source is no. Clinical features suggestive of sarcoidosis. Then you do biopsy from lung, yes, sarcoidosis is diagnosis. Biopsy from lung doesn't, is, is not positive. We look for other things. BAL is bronco, bronco alveolar lavage. Bronchial alveolar lavage means we insert, in, instill some fluid in the lungs, we get it back and we look for some specialized cells there, okay? And we call it possible sarcoidosis. So just to highlight, if a person has skin sarcoid and lung sarcoid and skin biopsy proves non crazy eating granuloma, we don't need to biopsy lungs. But of course, we need to do pulmonary function tests, EKG and all other tests, okay? To diagnose sarcoidosis in addition to the traditional bronchoscopy. So when you're looking for a place where they do a lung biopsy for sarcoidosis, you need to ask, whether they do endobronchial ultrasound in that place and they are rather good in doing that one, okay? And this is what we see again granuloma when we do endobronchial ultrasound, okay? And this is how, this is with the bronchoscope, we are inside the lungs and, and then we put the ultrasound there and the lymph node looks like this, okay? And then we insert the needle with the guidance. So it's more accurate, okay? And again, higher the stages, you know, your chances of being positive are high, okay? But the best is uh, whenever, but you have to have a lymph node in the lungs to do this, okay? So, my initial talk was supposed to be only heart sarcoidosis. So, I just want to let you know, there are no US or European guidelines, good guidelines to diagnose sarcoidic sarcoidosis. But Japanese Ministry of Health and Welfare has put out criteria and it'll, these slides will be uploaded. So you have criteria, you need to do the histologic diagnosis, that means you need to do the heart biopsy. Trust me, no one does it because the, when the heart biopsy, is the yield is not good, okay? Of course, you need to do the EKG, look for a lot of different things. Every patient I see with sarcoid, initially I get at least one echocardiogram to make sure the patient does not have heart failure due to sarcoidosis, okay? This is the old guidelines from 96. So, skin, uh, scintigraphy, proficient Italian scan, nobody does it anymore. Okay, just historical aspect. This PET scan is a much better version of that one. You can say that PET scan is like iPhone 6 and this pallium is like old uh, DOS computer, you know. Okay, okay. And a cardiac catheterization is needed in specialized cases. Okay. So, this just to summarize. If, how to evaluate for the heart sarcoid? You get a regular EKG, look for these features like bundle branch block. Uh, this is a very non-invasive office test. When you see a doctor in the pulmonary office, you can do an EKG too, okay? Signal average EKG is an investigational. We don't need to do this. Ambulatory EKG is for like a holter monitoring because remember, if heart sarcoid not only causes irregular heartbeat, it also causes uh, and it not only causes heart failure, it also causes irregular heartbeat. So we need to make sure by doing holter monitoring, you don't have any irregular heartbeat. Echocardiogram tells you about the cardiac function, cardiac PET scan and cardiac MRI, depending on the center and a physician's expertise. I just want to repeat it again, okay? Treatment, most patients do not require any treatment, but be, uh, and I think we already had on a uh, talk on uh, steroid sparing agents. Lung function tests are important to guide the therapy in a lung sarcoid, okay? When you have deforming skin lesion and a mild lung disease, you may need treatment for deforming skin lesions, which will treat lung sarcoidosis anyway, okay? So I have a table which will be uploaded, but I will highlight only on lungs and heart here. Lungs, you have shortness of breath, your lung function is low, you have these symptoms. <coughs> Start with prednisone 20 to 40. I would like to say that, you know, when I started doing this about 14 years ago, I used to start with them, everybody on 40. Nowadays, my steroid dose is 20, okay? Because my goal is no patient of mine should develop adverse effects due to treatment for sarcoidosis. That, and we have also become much better in using steroid sparing agents, okay? And inhaled corticosteroids, I do that if I see obstruction on a pulmonary function test, okay? Heart, if you have complete heart block, you, of course you need a pacemaker, okay? And if you have irregular heartbeat, dangerous arrhythmias, you need uh, 
AICD, it's an implantable cardiac defibrillator. It shocks the patient whenever they have irregular heartbeat. When you have heart failure, you may need a defibrillator when you have very low heart failure, but you need to treat the heart failure with heart failure specific medication like lysinopril, spironolactone and all those things. And also here I treat the patients with a higher dose of steroids, maybe 40 for one month, then come down with the steroid sparing agent, okay? But remember, it's sometimes the lung sarcoid and heart sarcoid treatment depends on whether we also have a neurosarcoid. Then we become very aggressive and may start patients on three medications. Corticosteroids, initial treatment 20 to 40, evaluate the patient one to three months and they sh dose should be gradually decreased. That's why you should follow up with the patients every uh, three months with the physicians. And uh, if the presence of reversible fibrotic disease, that means the, if the patient has a stage one sarcoid, it becomes stage three, that means it has not done anything, okay? And of course, if patients don't take medication, it does, it's not gonna work or the dose is inadequate. One of the things I always tell is start a lower dose like 20, but keep the patient on at least for six months to one year, but maybe five milligram or 2.5 milligram, but don't give like only one month and stop it. Okay, trick is to keep the patient on a low dose for a long time. Okay, and this is just for your information, different uh, drug dose treatment for sarcoidosis that will be on the website, okay. And uh, this is infliximab. I know we already had a talk about a steroid sparing agent, but just to add for the lung, when you have lower lung function and you have shortness of breath and we have other lung features, other organ involvement, you can treat the patient with infliximab, okay? And again, to summarize on the cardiac sarcoidosis treatment here, I talked about this part earlier and now I'll finish off with this part routine screening, okay, and we do all the screening, and we decided steroids, I want to say we use higher dose here. We can use methotrexate and other steroid sparing agents. See the patients every three months. If you have done an MRI, repeat it with an MRI. If you have done a PET scan, repeat PET scan, okay? And EP means electrophysiological evaluation. If any patient has palpitation, irregular heart patients, I don't send them to general cardiologists. I usually send them to electrophysiologists. Okay, for managing the irregular heartbeat. Okay, again, to insist every three months we need to see the patients. Okay, do the regular laboratory test to monitor the disease activity as well as the adverse effects of a medication. When you give steroids, always you have to worry about the bone health. I always get a DEXA scan on my patients when I start patients on steroids. Okay, uh, to assess the bone density. Eye exams, especially if you're on hydroxychloroquine. Summary, just to summarize, we know a lot more about sarcoidosis than in the past, okay? And uh, endobronchial ultrasound uh, has helped us, uh, lung doctors especially, to make better diagnosis of uh, lung sarcoidosis. PET scan is very useful in assessing the disease activity and determining the sites for biopsy, okay? And uh, also it helps in the cardiac involvement, okay? Please remember the, the outcomes are worse if you have pulmonary hypertension, that's a right-sided uh, hypertension, right heart uh, hypertension, okay? Fatigue, fatigue is an important symptom we need to treat in this patient, uh, in patients with sarcoidosis, okay? Biological agents, anti-tumor uh, necrosis uh, factor, they're all available for the use. And of course, my pet, uh, topic is using steroid sparing agents. We have to use them a lot so that we do not cause adverse effects in patients due to high dose steroids unnecessarily. Okay? Because safety is important. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you.